Well, the Canadian Council of Chief Executives is uh, an organization um, whose members essentially are the 150 uh, CEOs of Canada's largest corporations. Um, they have uh, existed as an entity now for about 30 years. Uh, they tend to look at Canadian public policy issues from a, a broad cross-cutting uh, point of view, not sectoral, not regional, but to look at, at uh, public policy issues that are important for all of Canada. Um, the objective is to make a contribution to the, to the public policy debate to make Canada a better place that benefits everybody's business. So uh, it's, uh, it's that kind of, of policy-oriented uh, organization issues it's dealt with have ranged all the way from you know, free trade in the 1980s, uh, public finances in the 1990s, regulatory matters, competition law, um, even uh, constitutional uh, issues when that was topical for Canadians. So it's been, it's been, it's been uh, wide ranging. Um, my experience with it as an organization when I was a minister was that it was uh, quite valuable time spent because it's hard to get, you know, 80 or 90 CEOs in one room at one time. And these are people who are really on the front lines of uh, business in Canada and know what's going on and, and, and have, I think, useful views on, uh, on how to make things work. Okay. Um. In 2005, uh, you as well as Robert Pastor and Alan Gottlieb uh, worked on a task force for the Council on Foreign Relations entitled Building a North American Community. Uh, what were the goals of this task force and how far along have we come since then? Well, we, we tried to work uh, uh, collectively with a broad representation from all three countries, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Um, we were looking at Really, NAFTA, um, that many years, more than 10 years after it came into effect, saying, you know, what, what should be the next steps? Where, where can we go from here, if anywhere? And there was a broad range of views, certainly, among the, 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 the people that the Council on Foreign Relations asked to be part of that. I think that we uh, struggled a lot with this basic question. I mean, do you want to be you know, bold and brash? Do you want to be incremental? Um, do you need a common view for all three countries? Uh, can there be a common goal but moving at different speeds? And uh, so, uh, you know, we tackled a lot of those issues. We tried to make, I think, a, a, a contribution to uh, the direction that countries might go. Um, it was very much in keeping, our recommendations were very much in keeping with the initiative to create the Security and Prosperity Initiative. Um, but I, I have to say, you know, at the end of the day, has a lot been accomplished? Not really. Um, but, you know, sometimes these things take time to, to bear fruit. A lot of traditional manufacturing jobs have been moving to China and to India, uh, to Vietnam, to other countries. Um, I guess whether that's a problem depends on whether it's your job that was lost or whether you like buying plasma TVs for a fraction of what they would cost if you had them made in Ohio. So from a consumer's point of view, um, when businesses do things in the, in the most cost-effective way, they benefit. Now, w what that means for jobs in North America is some dislocation. But we need to prepare for the future, which means that we need to prepare our people for the kinds of jobs on which they are competitive. And, uh, and that sometimes means looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, you know, what, what are we going to do here? What, how are we going to improve our training, skills development, education for our people? How are we going to invest in, in uh, the kinds of jobs that will be that will be growing in the future rather than trying to cling to the ones that we're in the process of losing. I think we've seen the concept of national sovereignty eroded in a whole variety of ways. Um, and while it's an important concept, um, you know, it's compromised by the Geneva Convention, 
It's compromised by every treaty that any country enters into. It's compromised by the Charter of the United Nations. It's compromised by the, uh, by, uh, the, the human rights laws. Uh, so we, you know, I, I, don't, I think we need to be a little bit mature about the concept of sovereignty. Sovereignty is the ability of a country to act in its own best interests in accordance with international law and its commitments to other countries. That's how we have order. My personal sovereignty is limited by the fact that I can't encroach on yours. So, you know, I, 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 always, I find it amusing when people put sovereignty as in, 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 a, in a kind of crystal jar and say, well, this is the ultimate. Because really, sovereignty is, national sovereignty is, is one of the tools that we use in order to give democratic expression because we've got to break things down into a more manageable size. But at the same time, um, it's, it's a concept to be exercised with a certain amount of care. The recent uh, events in the financial world uh, are certainly going to drive more cooperation and collaboration around financial sector um, regulation simply because it became clear that you know having everybody have different kinds of regulation in the financial sector didn't reflect the fact that uh, there was a great deal of interdependency and therefore the fact that you know n subprime mortgages were being syndicated in the United States that that could somehow or other cause the bankruptcy of a municipality in Norway or you know, the downfall of a bank in the United Kingdom or elsewhere. Now we know um, something that we should have already known, which was that the world financial system was highly integrated. Therefore, we've got to find better ways of communicating and cooperating. Um, otherwise, we risk another event like we had in 2007 and 08. Information and a knowledgeable public is a fundamental requirement for a democracy. And uh, I, I worry greatly about the fact that, that people are, in many cases in our modern democracies, will, willfully uninformed. It's not that the information isn't available, especially with the internet. You can get information if you want it, but people just aren't interested. Um, in, a, in a recent by-election in Ontario, 25% turnout, 25%. Unlike Afghanistan, nobody was threatening to cut your fingers off or to kill you if you voted. So but there is a lack of democratic engagement and, uh, and, and part of that is a lack of involvement with understanding the issues, whatever they may happen to be.